Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to the New Books Network. This is Alim Mahaber. In this episode, we are grateful to be joined by Philippe Richard Morias, who will be speaking on his book, The Unexceptional Case of Haiti, Race and Class Privilege in Postcolonial Bourgeois Society, published in 2022 by the University Press of Mississippi. Philippe Richard is a assistant professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at the College of Staten Island. He has conducted extensive fieldwork in Haiti. He is writer, producer, and co-director of the film, A City Called Heaven. A very, very warm welcome to the podcast. I'm very excited to be talking with you, and I'm very excited about the conversation we're about to have. I thank you, Alim, for having me over. And I, it's it's a privilege and an honor to be talking with you and to address your audience. Yeah, it's great to have you on again. So first off, could you please tell me a little bit more about yourself, I guess, going a bit beyond what I just said in the intro, you know, personal story, how you came to be who you are today, and you know, what experiences prompted you to write the book we're talking about? Uh well, the book that I ended up writing is markedly different than the book that I went to Haiti to write, that I went to do research in Haiti. I'm a native Haitian, and uh, I like to tell people that uh, after being in the States for so many years, I still travel on a Haitian passport. Uh, so I'm very much a Haitian person. And uh, like many people who are engaged with social justice uh, from an early age, uh, at some point, and people are privileged in Haiti, uh, people who are privileged in Haiti often at some point awaken to the conditions around them, the conditions of the country. Uh, There's nothing uh, about them uh, that's natural, so to speak. There's nothing about what goes on in Haiti that just happens. It is the way it is because it's systemic. It is due to the ways things are done, the way things are structured. So uh, I left Haiti after high school. I came to the United States to for college. Uh, that's quite a long time ago, uh, depressingly long time ago. And I, I went to college at New York University. I studied film and television at uh, the film school, at, uh, as it's called, NYU. I went to the NYU, New York University Film School in Manhattan. And after I graduated, I went back to Haiti, basically to a normal pattern. After college, you go home. And then I spent two months, after which I decided I had to get out of this place because I was, I was about to, you know, I might just have a nervous breakdown in terms of the way things were looking to me after spending four years getting an education on how the world works and how unequal the world that we lived in can be and how brutally unequal it can be. And when I went back to Haiti, I began to be very, very conscious of the structures of oppression in the country and uh, and what goes on. So I stood, and that was right before, the year before the collapse of the Duvalier dictatorship. So I came back uh, to the States uh, And I settled down in the States and I started working in the, in, um, at the City University of New York in academia, while also pursuing film projects and various kinds of intellectual endeavor. Uh, And after I completed uh, the last time I worked in film and completed a feature, Things were quite unsettled in Haiti. It was after the coup d'etat against Aristide in 1991. 
And in the ensuing here years, I got very engaged, like a lot of other uh, Haitians who came of age in privilege in Haiti, both in Haiti and in the diaspora. There had been this movement that looked like Haiti was going to be transformed with the election of Jean Bertrand Aristide in 1990. The Lavalas movement was looking like truly transformative. And a lot of us who had grown up, who had come come of age in Haiti, middle classes and in Haiti elites for that matter, and wanted to see a new kind of Haiti, a new Haiti, where the vast majority of the population was not so radically marginalized. So after being engaged in that movement and seeing the collapse of it gradually over the 1990s, I decided that uh, I wanted to do work that would help me understand Haiti in a social science framework, scientifically understanding Haitian society, and uh, rather than activism, where when you are an activist, you are guided to a, lo- to a large extent by common wisdom. And it was beginning to seem to me that common wisdom, what passes for common wisdom in Haiti, uh, evidently was not working uh, because too often uh, the movement for social justice in Haiti kept coming to a dead end. Uh, So I enrolled in the PhD program uh, in in cultural anthropology at the City University of New York. And in... uh, 2011, I went to Haiti to do field work for what became my dissertation, and also, which was the principal empirical research that became the book. The book is not an adaptation of my dissertation. It is just an expansion of what I analyzed and what I studied. But the common thread from the first week that I was in Haiti is that the whole discourse about Haiti as a Black Republic, which I've taken to calling the Black Republic narrative, is just poppycock. It's a, it is a mystifying discourse that presents Haiti as somewhat united in blackness against the world. That is just a fanciful way of privileged Haitians to keep scrutiny at bay as across color boundaries, they are they in the elite classes and in the middle classes who are bilingual basically are united in culture to inflict all kinds of violence, economic, social, cultural, to the vast majority of the population that is monolingual Creole speakers. Uh, And that's been the gist of my work since, and that is the gist of the book. So the book is uh, take on what's called the color question in Haiti. And basically the color question turns around the fact that they are, from the birth of Haiti as a nation, there's been two formations. Uh, the mulattoes were <clears throat> initially people of mixed race uh, in the colony, uh, and then eventually in independent Haiti, uh, people are not necessarily of mixed race. If you are wealthy enough, you may marry yourself into the mulatto, formation, and then then the black formation. So what people, at least I never quite realized, that although it seems at a distance, if you follow the black republic narrative, you will think that Haiti itself is divided between the mulatto formations, the mulatto formation, mulattoes, 
who by and large do control the economy. You're, the economic the economic elite in Haiti is overwhelmingly mulatto, but not exclusively mulatto. There are blacks in the economic elite of Haiti, but overwhelmingly it is the mulatto elite, the economic elite. And then you had the black formation. But if you follow the black republic narrative, you will think that there's a mulatto and then the rest of the country constitute the black formations. That is not the case at all. What you have in Haiti is in the elites and the middle classes, you have mulattoes and you have blacks. But only people who are privileged Haitians actually see the picture like that. Blacks and mulattoes. Once you get out of the privileged formations, the middle classes and the elites proper, uh, nobody cares. Nobody even understands the concept of Haiti as a black republic. I analyzed that in the book. Right. So uh, and that's something that came as a shock to me. And that was a thing that I've noticed my f- by the end of my first week in the field as an anthropologist. I had been a Haitian for decades and I never noticed that. But having with my anthropological hat on, my hat on as an anthropologist, as an ethnographer on the ground, in less in just about a week, I became aware that. A, anytime you hear there's a question of color in Haiti about blacks or mulattoes, it's inevitably, inexorably an issue among privileged people. That has nothing to do with the vast majority of the population that are completely oppressed, completely marginal, radically marginalized, politically, socially, culturally. Right? So the question of color is a business between privileged people. And it's a, only a political issue. Only at the political level are they fragmented. But at the cultural level, they are all united. They are all bilingual. They are French-speaking people. And their perspective on the world is basically like privileged people throughout the West, their legacies of the European Enlightenment. They have nothing to, including the dark-skinned Haitians, who quote-unquote would be black. The the bilingual ones are just like the mulattoes, privileged people, westernized people, who have nothing existentially to do with the dark-skinned people who are not in the privileged classes, who don't, who are not, uh, who don't have access to social privilege. So that's in terms of how I came to write the book and the broad concern, the broad scope of the analysis of the study that I pursue in the book. I hope uh, that's not a too long-winded uh, answer to the question about how I came to the book. Not at all. It was perfect. It was extremely comprehensive, and I definitely appreciate it. Uh, there's a lot of stuff uh, we could dig into um, with that response. Um, but first off, I, I want, I'm wondering if you could expand on what exactly do you mean by the unexceptional case of Haiti? Because as soon as I saw the book, you know, the title that in and of itself was striking. You know, as I'm wondering, um, as many who first glance upon the book will wonder too, what, unexceptional in what sense, in what ways um, does the book um, elaborate? Uh, could you elaborate on that? Yes. Uh, and again, it goes back to what I've called the Black Republic narrative. People... And intelligent people, learned people, people with fancy degrees have taken at face value the idea that there's something truly exceptional about Haiti. Haiti was born out of the only successful slave revolution. That is totally correct, Uh, at least in recorded history. 
Haiti is the only successful uh, slave revolution that continued to exist and that was not overtaken by some other forces. Uh, so that is perfectly correct. But there's also this view that Haiti is this exceptional place that defied white supremacy and established this nation state and the powers of the West have been making it pay for its temerity, for its audacity to confront white power. And it's for that reason that Haiti is in the condition that it is. Because people, the West, the powers of the West cannot countenance the fact of the exceptional fact of Haiti as an independent nation. Um, but that is not true at all. There's nothing exceptional about Haiti. Haiti is just like the rest of the Caribbean. Haiti is just like the rest of the Western world. And that is, it's a, it's a thoroughly bourgeois society. To understand Haiti as a Black Republic is just a concoction, an invention of the Haitian elites to blind the world to the fact that Haiti is just another bourgeois republic. It's a bourgeois society, and that's what it was at its foundation. One thing I mentioned in the book that will be a shock to anybody who has knew Haiti as this exceptional place of freedom for Black people, and that is at its founding, when you read the Act of Independence of Haiti, it's hard not to conclude that the founding fathers who were Blacks and mixed race people, some of them had been slave masters, planters who owned slaves, rich planters who owned slaves of African ancestry in the colony of Saint-Domingue. So that was one part of those who fought against the French for independence. The other part were formerly enslaved people, also of African ancestry, but they had been enslaved up until the insurrection of 1791. So they founded this nation. And my goodness, this is an exceptional case. Black people founded their own country. That is exceptional in the West. Well, not really. Because if you read the Act of Independence carefully, and you read it with the, in the context of the uprising against white supremacy in the colony of Saint-Domingue, you cannot not conclude that the founding founders withheld citizenship from the former slaves who had been born in Africa. So there is, at the founding of Haiti, a violence done to people who are Blacks, but of African birth. And it's being done to those Africans by other Blacks and mixed with people of African ancestry who were born in the colony. So at its founding, hey, the founding fathers of Haiti granted citizenship to those who had been born in the colony and withheld citizenship from African. So that's something that you found throughout the Caribbean. The people of Creolite, they basically, you know, said, you know, the native Africans had nothing to contribute, right? I mean, you find this anti-Black, this anti-African just all over the West. And people, of, people who are Blacks and have a certain education, they have so many different ways to distance themselves from Blacks without an education in dominant ways, in dominant cultures of the West. And to me, that is what, as a social justice activist, as an engaged scholar for social justice, that I want to bring attention to. Haiti was a bourgeois society at its birth, with all the prejudices of the Atlantic world, and also because, and I'm calling it a bourgeois society, because now 
in the spirit of bourgeois liberalism, everybody is free. There's nobody in bondage. Slavery is abolished and they abolished it themselves. They were, did not wait for whites to grant them freedom. They freed themselves and they forced Europe, they forced white supremacy to accept that. This is huge. You cannot take that away from the founding fathers of Haiti, from those, from those who fought against the French and chased the Napoleonic army of the territory. As a Haitian, I'm forever grateful to the ancestors who fought and founded Haiti because no matter where in the world I walk, I walk in the womb, I own the world, I own the womb. I don't care how many white people are in there. I don't know what their, I don't care what their title is. I walked in a womb as a Haitian because of the legacy of the founding fathers of Haiti. I feel like I own the womb. I don't need anybody to grant me permission for owning the womb. I own the womb. So you, you can't take that away from the founding fathers of Haiti. So my critique is not to deny their greatness in the history of the West, but I want to situate them in the history of the West as Westerners who chose to put their nation state in the West, in the world of the Atlantic as it, as it existed. So if we're going to confront the implications, the injustices being done to people today and the injustices being done to people at the time of the founding of Haiti, even during the revolution, where the elites of the revolution and the founding founders and their immediate heritage, uh, entourage in the armies, uh, in the uh, running of the colony, when they gained control of the colony, one needs to remember before Haiti became independent in 1803, blacks and mulattoes were running the colony from about 1793-94 onward, and definitely, it's definitely by 1796, Toussaint Louverture, one of the founding founders, a black who had been a slave and then became a slave owner, he really was in control of the colony, which was still a French colony, right? So. It's a complex story. When they freed the slave, they put the slave back at work as free people, as free ag agricultural workers on their old plantations. They were free. They were free workers. And now they were working for the benefit of an elite who controlled their, their economic production. That's why I call Haiti a bourgeois society at its founding. It's the only place in the Americas that at that time, or to put it differently, it's the first time in the Americas that you find a state that says officially, formally, everybody is free. All people are created equal. Yet, you find a class of working people working, but their production, the things they create, the wealth they create through their work is controlled by an elite class. You have a working class of free people. They are not slaves anymore. Haiti was radical about this. We're done with slavery. We're done with bondage. That's the second society after France that said that so drastically in the history of the West. And it's the first one in the Americas that said that so drastically. But then it put those freed people to work in a system where the, the production of the workers, the wealth being produced by the workers, is controlled by an elite class not by the workers. That's the classic political economy of the bourgeois West. It's a proto-capitalist economy. 
And it's not a value judgment. I'm not making a judgment against capitalism. I'm just saying that's the first time you find the bourgeois ideal of everybody being free, everybody being free workers, but the production, the what the worker produces in terms of uh, what the labor of the worker produces is not controlled by the worker, but it's controlled by an elite class that control the means of production. That is bourgeois political economy. That's the first time you're ever finding this in the Americas. It was not until 1865 that you found that in the United States of America. It is in Haiti that you're finding this for the first time beginning January 1, 1804. And that's why I call Haiti a bourgeois society at its founding. So it's completely unexceptional. It is just like bourgeois society anywhere else in the West. And the elites and the middle classes dominate working people according to the norms of the day in that society. It's no different than the United States of France. It's the norms of the day in a particular place. In Haiti, in 18, in the, throughout the 19th century, the norms were what they were. In the U.S., in slavery, the norms of treating working people was something very different than it is today or than it was after emancipation in 1865, right? So the brutality against people who are dominated is a matter of historical norms, right? So the historical norms in Haiti are such that uh, when the slaves were freed and became free, freed workers on the plantation, they were working conditions were not very different than when they were called slave, when officially they were in slavery. Right? Today, they're no longer in slavery, but their domination are fairly still harsh. Right? Um, so it's a bourgeois society, uh, and the way things operate are maybe harsher than it is in the U.S., uh, but it's nonetheless a bourgeois society. There is nothing particular about Haiti. Haiti is not a place where everybody is black, therefore everybody is united against exploitation. Not at all. Um, thank you for that response. Very clear how you made it out to be that these uh, historical norms, uh, you link it and show how it continues to be a reflection of, of modern realities. I think you made that very clear in the book, and I found that very interesting. I, I want to um, move on to um, the methodology that you would have employed to engage in the field work, gather data, um, you know, talk to the participants as, as you write, uh, wrote the monograph. Could you um, talk on this? Oh, uh, yes, yes. Uh... So there are two parts, right, When in a work of ethnography. Uh, so uh, for, for those in the audience who are not familiar with uh, ethnography, ethnography basically is uh, when you're telling the story of uh, people, right? Uh, so you go in the field, you live with people, you live their life, you, you integrate your life. You become, quote, unquote, one of, one member of the society you intend to study. And what you're really looking to do is to get beyond what members of the society think, they, who they think they are, what they think they are saying, what they think they're doing. And when I said society, it could be, your field could be a neighborhood, it could be a company, right? But you're trying to discover what is really happening in terms of effect, right? It's one thing for people to intend to mean something through what they say. It's one thing for people to intend to do something or what they do, their actions. They have intention for the action. They, they think, that's what I want to accomplish through my action. 
That's what I want to convey through my words. On a day-to-day, in routine, I'm not talking about people getting on a stage and making big speeches and having big uh, ideals. I'm talking about on a day-to-day routine basis, in day-to-day language, in in day-to-day interaction with people. So, and what the ethnographer does is to try to pay attention to the effect of the words, to the effect of the action. What happened when people say those words? What happened when people take those steps, right? Uh, so, uh, uh, for example, I ask people in the middle classes, what, what does it mean to you that Haiti is a black republic? And I'm asking that to privileged black people. And they stutter. They, they, they can't quite tell me. And it's obvious that it is just a taken for granted. They just accept it. I go and I ask people who are outside circle of privilege, people uh, for the most part who are illiterate, not all, but people who, do, who could not read or write, and but for the most part, they do not have a scholastic, a scholastic education. I ask them, what does Haiti as a Black Republic means to you? And they have no idea what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, they have no idea what I'm... So once I see that, it begins to occur to me that people who buy this Black Republic stuff are learning it. They're not, it's not something that really existential. It's not because they're living it, something that they can point to it. It's because they learn it because they're stuttering. They, it's almost, why are you asking me something that's so obvious? And I say, well, I'd like to know, right? So when people start stuttering and they can't quite tell me why, what Haiti means as a black republic, other than tell me, as, and they eventually get to say, because of our ancestors, right? So it is not something that's connected to the realities of the country. And then you take that what you observe, and again, these are day-to-day conversations. You live, you you're sharing their life at home. You share, and you we in the discipline of anthropology, traditionally, they're called informants. You're informants. I don't like that word, so I prefer to call collaborators because I'm discovering from them what Haiti in this case is and is not. And we're doing it in conversation. So we're collaborating. And my understanding is coming out, not just from my observation, what I think, but also on their observation and what they think. It's in conversation with them that I'm making up my mind what it is that I'm observing and participating in, whether at their houses, at their place of work, at their place of recreation. I take that and you relate it to the existing literature to, or to the archives if you're, looking, if you're looking at document. And when I look at document, I realize, wait a minute, from the get-go, and there's an author who said that, when Desalin decided to call the country everybody black, he was not trying to deal with an issue in the population at large. He was trying to deal with an issue among Dessalines of the four founding fathers of Haiti, Jean-Jacques Dessalines is the preeminent one. He's the one that people know as the founder. There are four of them, but Dessalines is the face of, and, and with good reason, his bravura, his fearlessness really was the conclusive factor in driving the French out of Haiti, right? Out of the what I then was the colony of Saint Domingue. You, you it's very hard to deny that Dessalin Bravura and his uncompromising stance in the final stretch of the War of Independence, he really made that uh, possible. So much so that the three, or the two other leaders agreed without much discussion, without much dissent. To, for him to be the general in chief of the War of Independence, right? So Jean, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, now the country is created and the old formations of 
formerly mulattoes, light-skinned, mixed ancestry, and the blacks, they are now one elite. They are now one elite around the Salim. And the old divisions based on color are beginning to show up again. So the Salim wanting to nip it in the bird, I mean, to nip it in the bird, the issue of color to you know, to, to keep it from showing to, from even starting, he says in his constitution of eighteen o five, from now on we are all black. So that was his way of stopping the division of his elite between the fragmentation of his elite between mulattoes and blacks, because that was beginning to reappear now that the French were gone. This alliance across color lines was beginning to look like it might fracture. So Dessalines was trying to address a problem among privileged people. He was not trying to address a problem that the quote-unquote the masses had. So once I saw that in the literature, then it made sense to me what was happening on the ground. And then I began to realize that when dark skin, what you would call quote unquote black in the West, people who are privileged describe themselves, they almost never use the word black. They have all kinds of terms to refer to themselves, to their social color. They don't use black. And, I, and there are too many of them to give you, but one of them is born, uh, brown. Right, but not brown though it's in Jamaica. Uh, in Jamaica, but it's uh, you could be very dark, you know, you could be very light skinned, um, brown or brown feminine would work for either. It depends on context, but they do not call they do not call themselves black. When they call when they call themselves black, it's in political context or social context where they're invoking the blackness of the nation. It's this historic black. It's not a day-to-day black. Anytime a Haitian with dark skin and privilege tells you, I'm proud to be black, they don't mean me, the individual. They mean I'm proud to imbue myself with the historic blackness of the nation, the, the, the race of the ancestors, the race of the founding founders. But on a day-to-day basis, if a dark-skinned Haitian is going to talk about these very beautiful dark-skinned girls they met at a party, they're going to refer to her as any other kind of term. Oh, yeah, there was this beautiful and fill in the blank, and any number of terms that you can use but it's not going to be black. It's not going to be, I met this beautiful black girl at that party. No, 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 no. Are you kidding? No. Black <laughs> black is what you call the oppressed people, right? So uh, it took me a while to realize that was what was happening. Even when I was, you know, as a Haitian, I never put to, uh, that together. I never realized that when Haitians go about calling themselves all these other names, they were just not calling themselves black. Their social color is not black. So in the book, I, you know, I said, well, it sounds like their social color is not black, not dash black, because they're just avoiding the, they just will not use black as their social color, right? So again, that's to answer the question, the, me- the method, right? The method is to, you go, you follow how people are talking, the terms they're using, and uh, and you uh, and you find what the effect is. And in this case, the effect is to reserve blackness, day to day blackness, that is, for the quote unquote masses. But the privileged people who are otherwise black, quote unquote, they use a whole different other terms. And my favorite is, and again, to give people uh, your audience an idea, I'm driving in a car with somebody. She's telling me about this story of this beautiful young woman who died of AIDS prematurely. And she said, wow, she was so beautiful. She has a little color. I said, and then she stopped. 
and then the conversation continues. I said, wait a minute. So I, we, we, there, was, there was a third person in the car. So when that third person stopped talking, so I go back to the woman telling me the story about a friend who died who had a little, a little color. I said, oh, oh, so what color exactly was she? And she said, well, you know, she, she had a little color. She was beautiful. And then she moved on. So a little color to the rest of you in the audience may sound very vague. But in Haiti, this was telling me that woman was part of the middle class. A little color, man. I'm not going to, for the time being, I can't find something to tell you. And I'm not going to say black. So she's a little color. She had a little color. It was not the first time I was hearing this phrase. But as an ethnographer, you begin, you are alert to what people are saying and what people are doing right, when you're doing an ethnography. So that's for the ethnographic part, right, to start paying very specific attention to what people are saying and to what people are doing. So that was, that's the very primary part of my methodology. And then, as I said, you, and you take pictures and you write notes. Like that afternoon, after that conversation of a little color, I went, I wrote copious notes of what happened in that conversation. Because in the conversation, I'm deep in it. I'm participating in the conversation. I'm just one of my, among my collaborators, I'm just one of them. So we're participating. At night, at the end of the day, or at some point, you go and in your, you write your field notes, it's called, right? So I write notes. And then eventually, when it's time to interpret your field experience, you go to your notes, when you read things and you put them together, you, you connect the dots between what you, the different things you witness, the different things you say, uh, people say, and you look at the archives, you look at what other researchers had said, and then now you interpret and you give a picture of what is happening right and this is how i came to uh this is how i came to understand haiti as a bourgeois uh, uh as a bourgeois society by doing this kind of approach uh if if it's if it's not too much uh in uh, on your audience's attention uh and in terms of other interests they may have uh alim uh, I could relate one of the, maybe just a couple of minutes to give another example of field work, right? How uh, things transpire to you. So I'm at a restaurant with a very successful black person who, who in Haiti, if somebody's going to describe him, you'll say, you'll come up with some other term, but you wouldn't call him black because he's wealthy. Uh, he's a, it's in the book, he's a physician. He's an entrepreneur, and he's describing uh, his life. And we're talking, and he's an old classmate. We were, we, we were childhood friends. We went primary school and secondary school from first grade to 12th grade together. Uh, so we, we were childhood friends. Uh, so he's telling me uh, the story of uh, his last vacation, right? Uh, his younger daughter wanted to go, his older daughter wanted to go to on a cruise in the Caribbean. So the younger daughter, because she's a little one, so the parents will, list, will be more inclined to give the little one what she wants than the older one, because, you know, the older one is already old. The little one is the spoiled, the spoiled one. So the little one is the one who, who comes and says they want to go to the, uh, on a Caribbean cruise. So... Uh, the parents make an arrangement to fly to Florida, get on a cruise, go to the Caribbean, cruise the Caribbean, go back to Florida and fly back to Haiti. This is not the stuff of white people or black people or Haitian. or It's the stuff of middle class, upper middle class, elite Westerners do. In the West, that is, right? So this was, and then in the same conversation while we're at the table, he also told me, uh, as we're talking, we're catching up all those years we had not seen each other. He also told me that 
Um, one thing is he does with his kids is something his parents did with him, and my own father did that with me, and that is periodically he packs the kid in the car and drive in the interior of Haiti so that they could see Haiti outside of port prince outside of the capital, how people live in the countryside. And when he goes far enough for him to come back to port prince to take care of his business for the day, that's when he comes back. And in the same conversation, he told me his daughter is fond of my moulin. My moulin is cornmeal. And among privileged Haitians, it has a connotation of uh, the, the food of the poor, of the poor sections of Haitian society. Right. I think I remember the story from the book. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Right? So, uh, so, the, and, and I realized that, and he told me when he's telling me that story, we, uh, he's telling me you know, a restaurant that I happen to have gone to uh, in the re- uh, recently. He told me we had La Plantation. It's a very fancy, very expensive restaurant, and it's a French uh, and French inflected restaurant. And the daughter wants my moulin, and he tells me he had to convince the daughter that there is no my moulin here. It's something that we have at home. and But here, you don't have to settle for what there is. There, you're not going to find my moulin here. And I realized that in the three stories he told me, he never noticed that. But in one story, he was a middle class, upper middle class Westerner. That's the story of going on a cruise. That has nothing to do with being black or Haitian. In the second story that he told me, he was the story of becoming a Haitian teaching his children about being Haitian, about finding out what Haiti is by taking them to the countryside. And the third part was about him being a Black Haitian. And that's the story about the corn mill, telling me how he proud, the, not just proud, how normal it is for he and his wife for the, for, to have a child who would want cornmeal, and that's her favorite food, and that's what she wants at this fancy French restaurant, is a way to tell me how much he identifies and respect and has some kind of empathy, some degree of empathy for the masses of the population who eat maimune. And this is the and that part, right? I didn't have to go to the literature, I didn't have to go what document exists, what other researchers had made, that was for my own training as an anthropologist to find meanings in what people are saying, even if they themselves don't see that meanings of what they're saying, right? So right then and there, and it was at that moment, I realized, oh my goodness, I am not studying a Black society. I'm studying a modern bourgeois society, right? Bourgeois, because we are this fancy French place, and this person is flying to Florida to go on a Caribbean cruise. This is people of means in a very unequal society where everybody is free. That's a bourgeois society. But also I'm realizing this is a very modern society because uh, one of the hallmarks of modernity is the capacity for people to define who they are. We are not, in a modern society, you're not who you are because of some tradition that says this is what you are, right? In feudal Europe, in early society, you were a Christian because, you know, the church said you're a Christian. The world worked a certain way because your church told you, your bishop told you, that's what the world was. In modern society, you choose to be who you are. You shape your identity. And that's precisely what this gentleman was doing, my, my childhood friend, the physician, right? He was defining himself as a Westerner. He was defining himself as a Haitian. And then he was defining himself as a Black Haitian. That is, a Haitian would belong to the Black formation. And that's because in the Black Republic narrative, Blackness, people who see themselves as Black nationalists, who see Haiti as a Black republic, 
always put forward a certain degree of empathy for the quote-unquote masses. In other words, they see themselves in unity with the masses at an ideal at an ideological level. It's an, at an imaginary level that has nothing to do with what goes on in real life on a day-to-day basis. That's the story of the cornmeal being the favorite food of this physician who's very wealthy, right? It's a way of identifying with the black masses, but the black masses are at a vast existential distance from him, right? So the modernity part, the part of being modern is for him to as, to ascribe this identity, to claim this identity for himself, right? Of being black, even though nobody will describe him as black, as a social color. If somebody is describing him in a social context, they'll call him brown. They'll call him brown. He's dark. He's darker than Obama. He's probably as dark as I'm trying to say, think of this, or LeBron James. I'm trying to give people a frame of reference that's fairly universal, right? Uh, uh, Serena Williams, LeBron James, is uh, that kind of complexion. But if somebody is going to describe in a social context, they'll probably call him brown. They're not going to call him black. But well, I found... did... yeah, oh, go ahead. Sorry uh, to uh, interrupt. No, well, I found please... really. Oh, okay, yeah. What I found really interesting was that um, uh, there was this sort of trend or propensity for, um, for example, for a black Asian for the you know social standing or the economic standing to influence how others um, perceived um, their color. And uh, I noticed um, that throughout the book. I'm wondering if you could speak on that as well. Right? Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, uh, you mean in terms of the way they want to be perceived? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I I know. I think I, I I noticed that in that um someone who may be described as um black, uh, if they were, for example, uh, in in a lower social standing, if they were a part of that elite class, they would more would be more likely called um um, um brown or, or or something like that, of a lighter complexion. I think you alluded to that earlier as well in the other example you would have given. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, uh, you want to know why that is, or sure. Yes. Yes. Okay. The reason for that. The reason for that is from the time of slavery, and one needs to realize that at bottom, what slavery was was just a system where workers were not paid for their labor, and then all the prejudices and all the racism that came to be associated with people of African descent came, that came after. What came first was the enslavement. What came first was, was the, uh, was the work, making people work for no pay. That came first. Then you had to justify it. To justify it, you have to, have, first of all, you had to be very brutal to make somebody work for no pay, you have to be prepared to be very, very brutal with that person. Take away their liberty, punish them harshly to force them to work for, for no pay. And then to justify the way you're treating them, you have now to treat them and call them subhumans, right? To convince the world that, they, that they're subhuman. So coming into the post-colonial world, now we're no longer on the plantation. There are no plantations around. It's still the, that history has carried with us where people of African descent, Blacks, are seen, even if nobody believes that, but there is the memory of seeing Blacks as lesser being. Even if you don't believe it, but at least having this prejudice against the semantic, right? Uh, uh, somatic blackness, the appearance of blackness. There's, there's, there's prejudice against it. It's just a legacy of colonialism. And as uh, the anthropologist, the, black, uh, the, the Jamaican anthropologist, Don Wabotham, uh, my mentor, pointed out in a very significant essay that... In the modern world, there is 
an articulation of political economic power and there's an articulation of cultural prestige, they go together. So you find economies of control by people of European descent, quote unquote whites, the major countries, if you will, of the West, the developed countries of the West, their dominant cultures are also dominant cultures in the global world. French, English, the dominant forms of those languages and their tastes, their cultures, they have the economic power, but their, their culture carries prestige also on the global scene. They go together. And so at the top, you find European culture at the top of the cultural hierarchy and European countries and countries generally dominated politically by people of European descent, that would be the USA, you find them at the top of the global economy. So that's the economic part. And you find them at the top of the cultural, uh, the global cultural hierarchy, right? And at the bottom of both, you find black populations are generally at the bottom of the economic scale in just about every country, uh, of the West, that is, and at the bottom of cultural prestige, just about anywhere in the West. So if you are privileged Blacks and you circulate among people of privilege in spaces of privilege, whether you're very wealthy, like Obama, or just middle class, like your average black physicians, you come up with a way to distance yourself from the blackness that's at the bottom. So that's why people, and not just in Haiti, throughout the Caribbean, most famously in Martinique, you find all kinds of names for people of African descent to, so that they can distance themselves from those who are, quote, unquote, really black, that is, those that are at the bottom of the economic hierarchy, of the social hierarchy. They are at the bottom because of their economic conditions. They're not at the bottom because they're black. That's why they're at the bottom. If that was the case, you would never have Barack Obama as president of the U.S. He's black. He would never be get to the top there. You'd never get any black billionaires. There are quite a few black billionaires. There are... Uh, American Express has been run by a black person. Mary, Mary Lynch, which caused the cataclysm, the financial melt, meltdown of, of 2008. At the time, the CEO of Mary Lynch was black. The Xerox Corporation was once run by a black woman. McDonald's was run by... So you find black people running Fortune 500 companies. That's not anything that surprises anybody anymore, right? So if, if people are at the bottom of the social and economic hierarchy because they are black, well, you'll never find blacks in these positions. If you find black in these positions, it's because the blacks were at the bottom. There's something else besides their skin color, why they're at the bottom. And usually it's because they don't have access to what bring people of color to spaces of privilege, and that is an education in the dominant cultures of Europe. You're not going to find anybody who is anybody and wealthy and people, a person of color, whether it's Barack Obama, whether it's, what's his name, uh, uh, the guy who just became uh, the prime minister of uh, the UK now, uh, the of Indian ancestry, right? It doesn't, whether they are whether they're at the very top or whether it's just your average anonymous physician or college professor speaking to you, right? We all got into our positions of privilege because we became educated in the dominant cultures of Europe. And also, the white people who are privileged, they also are very well educated to different degrees in dominant cultures of Europe. So 
you distance yourself from the blacks at the bottom by finding ways to distance yourself from them. Whether it's the, and different societies do, do it differently, right? They come up with alternate terms to refer to themselves so that they don't use black. In the U.S., um, everybody goes about saying the N-word. They don't want to say the N-word. Well, no. Uh, privileged black people use the N word to distance them among themselves to distance uh, themselves from the blacks at the bottom, and privileged white people they call the whites at the bottom without the education in dominant uh, uh, European cultures they call them white trash. We can all say white trash. We don't say the W T word. We all can say white trash. But when it comes to the other words for blacks at the bottom, we call them the N word. Right. These are all strategies to make to among privileged people to be able to know who is who, right? To, uh, even though you are black, even though you're a person of color, you can become president. You can become uh, prime minister of uh, Great Britain, right? But you also have to distance yourself from the blacks at the bottom. One thing that I've used in, a, in, a, in an interview recently, not in the book, is the fact that when Barack Obama became president, Barack Obama spent eight years hectoring, quote unquote, black men to be responsible. When he was saying this for eight years, I don't recall any privileged black men who found something wrong with that because evidently they all assumed he was not talking to them. And then Obama said that in a commencement speech at Morehouse College. Morehouse is where elite black people send their children if they don't want to send them to the Ivy League, if they don't want to send them to quote-unquote white universities, they send them to Morehouse College. So Obama said that, Obama said that same thing, hectoring the graduating class to be responsible. There was an uproar. He was saying it for eight years. Nobody cared. When he said it in a space of privilege to privilege blacks, when he said it to privileged blacks, now privileged blacks told him, what are you talking about? And he has not said it since. So when he was, say, when he was saying it for eight years, he was distancing himself and privileged blacks in general. And that's just one example I'm giving you, right? Because these things really matter for us to be very cognizant of the relationship between race and power. There's nothing that says a black person in a position of power is going to behave any differently toward blacks who are not in position of power than whites in position of power would. And that black person in position of power will not deal with whites who are not in position of power any differently. Right? And I was talking with um, Adolf Reed, and this is in conversation on a panel, so it's public conversation, but it's not published uh, uh, article, it's, it's not a scholarly publication, and Adolf Reed is saying that, well, you know, people should start paying attention. Perhaps that has something to do with the rise of Trump, right? That people are so fed up in the working class that are thinking that, you know, this Everybody with this discourse that if you're black, that means you're oppressed, you're dominated. And there are people who are white who are oppressed and dominated. And they keep seeing, seeing all these black people in position of power. So there, maybe there's something, some of them uh, are not necessarily racist, but they're just pissed off. Right? I mean, that's the point that Adolf was making that I want to make myself. Right? There are implications uh, to this when we go about equating color and power because there are in Haiti. And the reason I make the connection to the U.S. is that when you do a, a book like mine, Haiti is just a lab, right? Haiti is just a lab, but we're trying to reveal things that are 
found beyond Haiti, you know, in a universe beyond the place where you're doing the field work. So I need to explain that. That I need to make that point. So what I what I find in Haiti is not just applicable to Haiti. It's applicable to any uh, any bourgeois society in the West, right? It's what I call capitalist modernity, because capitalism doesn't care who's going to make it work. Whether you're white, whether you're brown, whether you're maroon, whether you're green, if you have the education and the talent to keep the capitalist engine going, you will find your place in it. It may be at the very top, like those guys who run Fortune 500 companies or who run countries like Barack Obama, or it may be somewhere in the middle, the quote-unquote middle classes, including college professors. But some of them, and the space for us to speak in resistance to inequality is part of the contract. It's part of the social contract. So my work, the work I did in Haiti, is to make this thing salient. And I'll stop here just in case I'm going overboard. And if I have a moment, I can add uh, some more along these themes. So I just wanted to stop a little, Alim, to give you some space. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. No man, you have free reins. <laughs> you're, you're all good. You're all good. Yeah. yeah. One thing, then, uh, very quickly. One thing I would want your audience to be mindful of, also, right? In, in in terms of when you're thinking of when I keep saying to people, it's not race, it's class. If you really want to understand why the world is the way it is, if you really want to understand why most of people disproportionately in the society, the people at the bottom are black in the U.S. or in Haiti. Don't take of it in terms of race. Take of it in terms of class. It is very true. But if you take of it in terms of class, if you take of it in terms of race, you're giving a pass to the people who are doing the domination who happen to also look like the ones that are at the bottom. You, just, you cannot not give them a pass because how are you going to make the two apart, Right. Now, if we don't want to do that, if those of us who happen to be people of color are resistant to do that, and we still think want to think of ourselves as some uh, as people who are for a just society, if we want to think that we are working for social justice, but we refuse to see the thing through class, and we want to see it through race then I've got news for you because the white elites don't have at all a problem. And the best example I can give to people is a book that came out in 2017. It was written by a white historian at Yale University, which is a bastion of whiteness, if you ask me. And and the book was about... American womanhood, not black womanhood, not white womanhood, American womanhood, and the effect of that traditional year in Paris when you're in college, right? Study abroad, year in Paris. So right then and there, you're talking about privileged people. But the person, the I forgot the name of the book. It's called The Years in Paris, actually. And I forgot, the, unfortunately, the author's name is escaping me. But the book is about, it's presenting itself as American womanhood in general. But of course, American womanhood in general, once you throw in a year in Paris, you're not talking about American womanhood in general. You're talking about privileged American womanhood, right? And who are the three women that she takes as a sample? As an example, Jackie Onassis, or Jackie Kennedy Onassis. So this is a woman who was first the wife of a U.S. president, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Then she became the wife, the wife of the richest man in the world at the time, Aristotle Onassis. So it's the first of the... Right. So the second woman she takes as a sample is Susan Sontag, probably one of the 10 most famous intellectuals, U.S. intellectuals of the 20th century. She really was influential. She was very much part of the U.S. elite, maybe not the economic elite, but the intellectual elite, because her her thought shaped conversation. So, so far, and you're going to have to hold tight to your seats because I'm getting to the third woman, right? So 
somebody, a white historian working out of Yale University, a bastion of whiteness, is talking about, is writing about American womanhood. And it's a normative book. The first woman is Jackie Onassis. The second woman is Susan Sontag. Now hold on to your seat. The third woman is Angela Davis. Angela Davis in the 1960s was a radical black painter. She went to jail, almost went to jail, because of her radicalism, her radical politics as a black nationalist. But now in the book, the elites of the U.S. have claimed her as one of their own. Because she is now a professor of philosophy at uh, UC, I don't remember which campus of the University of California. So we may not be wanting to see the world through class, and I say we, those of us of color who are fighting for social justice, including for people of color at the bottom, if we insist on seeing it as a matter of race and a matter of color, I've got news for you. The U.S. elites that you're standing against, that you're trying to, whose domination you're trying to resist, they don't see it that way. They do see it as class. So that's why they claim Obama as one of their own. They claim Angela Davis as one of their own. Never mind Clarence Thomas. Never mind Obama. But they're claiming Angela Davis. They have made her one of her own. They have whitewashed her black nationalist past. You read the book. They don't say, they don't skip the part that she was in the Black Panthers Party. But it's like, well, it was a way station. She was finding herself. But they don't, the white U.S. elite don't have a problem seeing class, not race. They don't have a problem accepting Obama as one of their own. They don't have a problem accepting Clarence Thomas as one of their own. So if we now, in the resistance to inequality, refuse to see things through class and wants to see it through race, the adversary on the other side is, not, is, is claiming the people that we think is part of us because they're Black. The elites that we want to stand against, in resistance against, because of what they're doing to people at the bottom, the people who are claiming as are ours because of their race, Obama, Angela Davis, or clients, or whatever that may be, well, they're claiming it as their own on the basis of class. We're going to be totally incoherent in a movement for social justice if we keep seeing things through the lens of race. And what I would like ultimately for my book to contribute to the movement for social justice anywhere in the West where there are people of color and whites together is to learn to see inequality and privilege not through the lens of race, but through the lens of class. Very, very well said, Philippe. Um, I, I think um, we could begin to wrap up now and just um, going over the, the conclusion, the concluding chapter of the book. I want to mention that um, sort of demonstrate in that chapter how the knowledge gleaned um, you know, from the Haitian experience, the Haitian example you explored, it might inform post-colonial movements of um, social justice, not just in Haiti, but uh, the world, as you mentioned just now. So I'm wondering if you could expand on that. You know, what prescriptions um, do you think um, you or the book could offer you know, for Haiti and post-colonial society in general? Um, how do we begin to, you know, move forward? Um, how, what ways can research and policy, you know, might help to facilitate this? Uh, one way to me, to have a true movement of social justice is to begin to readjust to readjust the way we think of racism, right? It seems to me, for the most part, when people think of racism, 
it's a matter of making mainstream Western society, wherever you are in the West, in the US, in Haiti, in Canada, in France, making, getting mainstream Western societies to learn not to see Blacks, not to see people of color in some diminished lens, in some diminished fashion, right? I don't think that's the problem. The problem is not so that when people look at a person who's black, to see that person, to not quote unquote see color, that's never going to happen. Because the problem is not that the black skin does not have value. The problem is the white skin does not has uh, is given value, and to you and you're never going to close that gap because it's natural. So for me, a movement for social justice that is at the same time anti-racist will be a movement to try to devalue white appearance, devalue white complexion, devalue white hair, so that when people see white hair, when people see fair complexion and they are black, they don't go try to lighten their skin. Because, and that happens in the US, in Jamaica, in Haiti, blacks do skin bleaching. That means you're trying to bring your skin to the level of the, what you may call it, to the level of the um, uh, standard, right? The reference, the reference is white skin. No, we need to devalue white skin. And there are ways that can be done, right? And that may be a, a different kinds of studies. Why when people look at a black skin or black, or I mean, a white skin, fair complexion, or they look at smooth, straight, blonde hair, they see some kind of value. That's a phenomenological thing. You're looking at something that's objective. It's just a natural thing. There must be things that's going on that's making you see value in it. Well, we need to devalue white complexions. We need, we need to devalue white appearance. And that's perhaps a whole different bo- uh, podcast. Uh, I'll stop there. So my recommendation is those of us in anti-racist movements, in uh, social justice movement, let's not get too hung up on why is the cop not seeing the value of black. The question is why, because the black, the cop does not see a white skin, right? And once we start devaluing white skin, then people who see black skin will no longer be exp- wondering, you know, they won't act because they didn't see a, black, a white skin in front of them. Right? So the, val- the problem is the valuation of whiteness. It's not the devaluation of blackness. It's the valuation of whiteness, of white appearance. You get rid of that, and now we're all going to compete on matter of cultural competence in the society in which we live. Well, Philippe, I think that's uh, salient, uh, a good note to end on. Um, so it's at this point, I'll ask, um, you know, what's next for you? Are you open to build on the ideas you explored in this book in any way? Is there any new material you're working on you would like to share? Anything I might have missed you want to bring up? Yes, yes. Uh, I am currently working on an article that hopefully uh, will appear in the magazine Small Acts. I don't know. I'm going to submit it to Small Acts, but hopefully it will appear in a magazine, uh, in a journal, I should say, in a journal uh, sometime next year, in uh, in a year or so. And it deals with uh, prejudice with between privileged people and not privileged people in the Caribbean, in Haiti, but also broadening it, right? And uh, as we were talking before the broadcast, uh, one of the re- things I'm comparing is how in Haiti, people of privilege use their power to decide what is what, who, uh, what the country is, what the to marginalized people in Haiti who don't speak French, who are monoling- monolingual Creole speakers. They speak Haitian Creole. Privileged Haitians are bilingual. They speak French and, and, and Creole. And I'm using that to draw a parallel how that works in Haiti, how Haitians 
who are nationalists, who are for social justice, still manage to marginalize poor Haitians through language. And um, in the Caribbean, the same thing happens, right? Even people who are poor independence, creolization, they did their darndest to exclude Indo-Caribbeans. In Trinidad, people... Uh, I should no. I should tell you right, Alim. You from me. You 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 probably uh, know this uh, more than I uh, than I am. But early in creolization theory, right, when people were were competing for power, very intelligent and educated blacks in Trinidad, in Jamaica, they basically started saying that Trinidadians and Jamaicans, Caribbeans of Indian descent, did not contribute anything to Creole culture, anything to Trinidadian culture, anything to Jamaican culture. They, people actually say those things, right? So to me, what I want to expand it is to not uh, to shift the conversation, not just from Haiti, but to shift it to the broader Caribbean, to see for people to be aware, for people to be interested in issues of inequality, of privilege, that and discrimination that exists among people of color in the Caribbean, leaving out the white Caribbean, leaving out the white Creoles, uh, leaving out the Beques in the French Caribbean, leaving them out just among people of color. The kind of how the discrimination pre uh, presents itself right so that's what I'm, I'm working on now in terms of an essay and beyond that uh, I would like to write a book on the history of modernity through race and class to show how from the get-go uh, people of color, were seeking positions of power and were attaining positions of power even in the 1800s, even in the late 1700s in the U.S., in what became the U.S., right? They, they were, that stopped in the U.S. in a way it didn't stop in, in the Caribbean. I mean, you had people of African descent owning slaves and being plantation owners. I want to write a history of modernity that brings that out so that people realize that it's been a long time since it's been about, it's a long time since it's been about class, not race. And so by specifically making it the history of modernity, I will be, I'm looking to put it more salient that at the very beginning of capitalist modernity, you find that people of color had power and they did not treat other people of color below them any better than their white counterparts. Well, I'm very much interested in reading that essay in Small Axe. I'm very much interested in reading that new book eventually when it comes out. Not sure how far away it is the publication or if it's just an idea in your head right now. But whenever it is, um, I'll be the, I'll be among the first to read them. Very, very much interested in your work, Philippe. It was great talking to you about it. And just before we go, where could people um, you know, find you uh, so they could find that essay, find that book, um, find out about... Uh, the unexceptional case of Haiti. Uh, uh, one thing about me that's kind of exceptional is that I'm not much on social media. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I do my bestest, if you were to, as my kids used to say when they were little, uh, I do my bestest to try to have a social media profile and I can't get the hang of being there on Facebook uh, where I have an account. So, uh, gee, uh, I really thank you for the opportunity of saying that I I don't have much of a uh, social media profile. However, the book itself, the current book, is available uh, anywhere books are sold online. It uh, you'll find it on Amazon, just about anywhere on any platform, and also uh, on the website of the University Press of Mississippi. And uh, I guess I will start trying to build a social media presence between Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. At least I know the names of them. But, um... <laughs> that's a start. That's a, that's a good start. 
<laughs> but I do I do believe that I need to be a little bit more out there. And I truly appreciate it, Alim, for the opportunity to speak with your audience. Uh, uh, perhaps next time it might be something with a Q&A where it, be, it might be more conversational uh, than a podcast. Uh, but Sure, you know, sure. Maybe. Uh, uh, but this episode, it, it was all about you and you made it really uh, easy for me. You basically answered all the questions I was about to ask. So yeah, it was easy being in the podcast I wrote today. So I thank you for that. All right. Yeah.